Good morning. The stand. Come on, church. You're awake and well. Come on, give Jesus a little love here, all right? Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be my mind hurt. My heart is receptive, and I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're so glad you're here. Welcome all of you watching online. Uh, we will conclude the series entitled Burning Bridges. And uh, there's a question mark by that is, is, should we burn bridges? And this was all born out of a Zoom small group I'm involved with. Uh, it's, it's a national small group of business leaders and pastors that, that meet every Saturday on Zoom call. And uh, the question that was being asked on this particular day, we were kind of talking about how to address relationships and what to do with those. And uh, one of the pastors from Northern California is probably the most grace-filled pastor I've ever met. And, and uh, then there was another one from Southern California. You can tell California's crazy. And, uh, and so one of them said, man, it's one and done for me. You mess with me, you mess it up, it's over. And the other guy said, you know what, I just never do that. He said, I, I, he gave examples of it, and, and I resonated with the Northern California guy that said, you know what, you never want to burn the possibility of having a relationship with somebody. Uh, you just don't want to do that. I don't believe Jesus does that. I don't believe we should do that. And I understand in boundaries, you create boundaries, nothing wrong with that. I believe there are seasons, and I believe there are reasons that we have relationship with people. And, uh, and sometimes that season ends and another season comes. And uh, so you, there may be another season for that. So you, you hold out for that. But the reality is uh, that the greatest problem that we have really isn't with other people. The greatest problem we have is with ourselves. And uh, if we can own that and we can protect that relationship with ourselves, in other words... There are bridges inside my life that need to be burned, things that I don't need to go back to and things I won't go back to and things I'm very aware of. And so it's very important as we conclude this series, today is I'm very excited about because there are so many questions about this. Well, how do I know and when do I go and what do I do? And, and this is where I believe we have to uh, really include, as we should all the time, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our guide. He's our comforter. He's our leader. He's our, the voice of God in our, in our soul. And so there are, there are times that uh, the Holy Spirit will tell you that you need to uh, separate, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, is separation is not burning a bridge. It's just creating a buffer, a, 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 a no-contact zone until you feel like either you can handle the situation or whatever happened between you and someone else is now, it's time for reconciliation. That's good too. Um, but we, we have to realize that uh, sometimes we accidentally burn bridges as well. We don't mean to. Story of a, a, a real good Christian family, and they decided that they were going to have some of the church folks over to their house for dinner. And so the mother's cooking dinner, and she's just getting everything ready and uh, the guests begin to show up, and the families are all there, the kids and everybody. So the mother finally finishes dinner, gets everything on the table, and she looks at her little daughter and, and says, you know, honey, why don't, why don't you pray over the meal? And, and the little girl said, you know, Mom, I, I, I don't know what to pray. She said, well, just, just pray what, what I would pray, what your mother prayed. So she said, okay. She goes, dear God, why did I invite these people over for dinner? <laughs> And sometimes it's unintentional that you burn a bridge or that you make a mistake and there's nothing you can do about it except say, I'm sorry. And uh, so the little girl, got to be careful what you say in front of your kids. So sometimes we need to avoid situations and locations where there is spiritual incompatibility with others. So there are people who believe that their way... Uh, to God or their relationship with God or their expression of worship is the only way to express your relationship with him. When I first got born again, uh, I was playing uh, 
in a fast pitch league, and a lot of church churches were in this this league, and 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 there was a lot of I, I won't say corruption, but they would pick players, and you had to go to church that church once a week. And and uh, I grew up in a very Pentecostal church, and I was playing for a Baptist church, and and it was a great team. Uh, but but I'll never forget uh, one of them said I he he didn't like the fact that you know I was in a different denomination playing for his team, but I'd been recruited, so I thought well, you know I, I love playing ball, so I'll you know I'll play for anybody but Satan, and. Uh, and so he said, um, he said, well, I am Baptist from the letter B to the letter T. And my response was, I'm a Christian from the letter C to the letter N. Because I thought, you know, your, your, your denomination doesn't define your relationship with God. It's just where you go, and, and that's where your comfort level is. And, and we maintained a good relationship. We kind of laughed about it later. But um, it's very important, I think, more than anything, that we are aware of people around us and that, that we have a level of sensitivity to the people around us. And, and for those who are type A people, this is not an easy thing to do because we're a get it done, we're a fix it type personality and I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying that what I have learned over the years and continue to learn is that there are extreme flaws in my personality. I guess I'm the only one here with that problem. Um, you know, and, and once you can become aware of your own issues and your own shortcomings and your own flaws, life gets a lot better. Because now, rather than looking and finding everybody else's flaws, when you wake up in the morning, you begin to focus a little more on what your responsibility is for that day. So in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it's a, it's a little bit of a confusing scripture uh, because Paul's talking to the church at Corinth about eating foods and meats, particularly sacrificed to idols. Now, if I were to bring this into modern times, um, I'm not sure that there is a grocery store that you can shop at that is 100% pure. When I say pure, you're buying groceries from people who probably don't believe in God. There's one particular chain recently that's had real upheaval over their position of, of being so liberal, and yet people shop there who are Christians. Well, the reality is, is you say, well, I'm funding them. Well, pretty much everything you spend money on from insurance to groceries to fuel, some of the people behind those corporations are not godly. Matter of fact, they're ungodly. And... and it's not, you know, I don't want to contribute to that, but we live in a world that we can't stop everything, but we can keep our hearts pure, even in spite of the differences that we have. And that's so important to me because the reality is sometimes God will put you in a position to be a light shining in that darkness. And if we burn the bridge between us and that world, we will never win them. And so I want to be very careful to know that sometimes God sends us into situations to be a light shining into that darkness and to love people that uh, religious people would tell you don't even go around them, much less love them. But the Bible says love never fails. So Paul is telling the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, but fortunately God doesn't grade us on our diet. I just freed some of you up right there, man, <laughs> that 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 pie that you were going to eat, God bless you, go get it. We're neither commended when we clean our plate nor reprimanded when we just can't stomach it. But God does care when you use your freedom carelessly in a way that leads a fellow believer still vulnerable to those old associations to be thrown off track. This is how the Message Bible, by the way. For instance, uh, say you flaunt your freedom by going to a ban banquet thrown in honor of idols where the main course is meat sacrificed to idols. Isn't there great danger if someone's still struggling over this issue, someone who looks up to you as a knowledgeable and mature, as knowledgeable and mature, sees you go into that banquet? The danger is that he will become terribly confused, maybe even to the point of getting mixed up himself in what his conscience tells him is wrong. So you can see that the... 
the difficulty with this passage of Scripture. Uh, in the Message Bible, it kind of brings it into modern-day terminology where we need to be aware. And my explanation to people is this. I am not your conscience, and you are not mine. Uh, you know, the, the debate between the Apostle Paul and, and Peter was that Paul was called to the Gentiles, and many of the Jews didn't like Paul because he was fraternizing with the Gentiles. Many of the religious uh, groups of Jesus' day didn't like the fact that Jesus was eating with people like Zacchaeus, who was a known sinner. So the difficulty here is we say, well, shouldn't we not participate? Well, I believe that the footsteps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord and that God will lead each one of us to where he wants us to go. One time, Mother Teresa was asked, you know, how did you how did God call you to the poor? Her response was very simple. She said, God didn't call me to the poor. God called me to follow him, and he led me to the poor. That's a great line, a great response, because we don't know why somebody's called to do what they're called to do. So what I'm trying to do here is I believe the Apostle Paul is trying to intervene in a way at Corinth saying be aware of of the people who eat and the people who don't eat, but don't burn bridges. And now it goes on in verse 11. I jump to, to 11 here. It says, Christ gave up his life for that person. Wouldn't you at least be willing to give up going to dinner for him? Because as you say, it doesn't really make any difference. But it does make a difference if you hurt your friend terribly, risking his eternal ruin. When you hurt your friend, you hurt Christ. A a free meal here and there isn't worth it at the cost of even one of these weak ones. Now, here is the the finishing touch. So never go to these idle-tainted meals. If there's any chance, it will trip up one of your brothers or sisters. There's a saying in modern times, read the room. Read the room. So that doesn't... You notice it doesn't say don't go. It says if they're going to be hurt, don't go. So what I would say in response to that is, as a mature Christian, the goal is to bring maturity to other people who are lesser in their walk with God. And so it's not saying it's wrong for you to go to that dinner, but it might be wrong for you to go to that dinner if that person says it would hurt my feelings. Then you say, well, I won't go then. The next time you want to go, just don't tell them you're going. Now, you say, well, isn't that hypocrisy? No, it's sensitivity. It's awareness. Because what's wrong for one person may not be wrong for another person. But we are so convinced that if somebody does something different than us, that that it's sin, and it may not be sin for them, but it's sin for you. Now, you have to understand, I have a, a brother, and, and it's known that my older brothers had struggles with addictions. I spent an hour on the phone with him last night going through some really tough times, and I know he doesn't mind if I share this. matter of fact, he'd probably be glad. And I told him, I said, you can hardly take a, a, an ibuprofen. I said, you, you, just, you cannot do what other people can do. Do you realize that? He said, absolutely, I do. So do you see what I'm saying? So I could easily make a case, and he's had, he's had alcohol addictions, and I could make a case that anybody who drinks wine is a sinner, based on my brother, but that's not accurate. After all, Jesus didn't turn water into grape juice. So, and again, if I said this in many churches, they would push back, and I'd say, I can't, you can't push back. Anything that is overly indulged is a sin. Not just alcohol, but anything. Don't get too excited. But we have our little pet peeves that we want everybody to abide by because this is our level of living. And the reality is, I am not your God, I am not your Jesus, and I'm not your Holy Spirit. Now, with my brother, I'm very strong with him because I love him. And I tell him, you can never do these things or you will fall off again. And there are other people who have no issues with it. They, they, they can control it. And, and it's, it's, there are so many different ways to approach this, and I'm trying to be very cautious because I do want to be sensitive. But the reason many people in the world don't come to church is because as Christians, we feel like we've figured out what is sin and what's not sin, and that we're going to judge them if they're different than us. 
And in a moment, I'll read a scripture where Peter and Paul, Mary wasn't there, so Peter, Paul, and Mary, Mary was absent. And so I'll read a scripture in a moment where there was a difference in, in, in what they were thinking and what they were dealing with. But they didn't burn the bridge, but they did have a discussion. So the very first thing we have to do is we have to call it our problem. Okay, I, I have to own my own problems. So if I just say, forget you, I don't care, I need to first ask myself the question, do I care about this person enough to forego this meal at this time? Yeah. Ask yourself the question, is there something I can do to keep somebody from stumbling? Now, that doesn't mean you're always going to do it. And, and if somebody presents themselves uninvited to you and you're doing something different than what they would do, that's not your problem. But it is your problem or my problem if I have a problem honoring a person who may not be in a position to handle what I'm doing. This is a very difficult presentation. I get that. It's a difficult sermon to preach because what I'm saying to us is that as mature Christians, and when I say mature, you guys know I feel like we're all maturing. But at our level of maturity, there should be an understanding of awareness and sensitivity toward other people. That doesn't mean that other people aren't always going to see you, disagree with you, or whatever, but the number one thing that we have to do on both sides of this, the people who eat meat sacrificed to idols and those who don't is this. Never fail to love both sides. Those of you who say, well, you know, I can't go to a meal sacrificed to idols. You need to love the people who can. Because it's just meat and they're not worshiping the idol to which it was sacrificed. Okay? So we need to be very careful. Otherwise, we will burn opportunities to have a conversation and create a relationships that elevate other people. And our goal is to elevate, to bring people up to a level. You got to understand, when I got saved, I pretty much thought I could not do... I mean, you, you know, I grew up, and I've told you this many times, you didn't play cards, you didn't shoot pool. You, I mean, none of those things. And there was nothing sinful about pool. And, and there's nothing sinful about playing cards. They said, well, well, you know, listen... You know, people do bet and lose money. Yeah, they do, and it's stupid. But if that's what they want to do, it doesn't mean I'm going to judge them for it. I just think, I'm not losing money that way. I'd rather go buy clothes. <laughs> but, but again, you, you see it as wrong. They say, well, if I allocate $100 to play cards and you pay $100 to play golf, what's the difference? Now, see, you're going to judge me because all I'm doing is throwing ideas out there to help you think. That's all I'm doing because here's the problem. We want everybody to be like us because we feel like if everybody's like us and Jesus comes back, we either all go up together or we all miss it together. It's the old saying, misery loves company. I don't want to go to hell by myself. Let me get a group of people that believe like me and we can all go to hell together. That, that's the mentality is we're so worried about being alone in our convictions that, that we, we're not sure that they're really right, but if we can get 20 people to agree with us, then maybe my convictions and my theology is accurate. And that's not accurate. So rather than trying to get everybody else to believe the way you believe and think the way you think, why don't you have a relationship with Jesus and why don't you let him lead you personally regardless of what anybody else does? And you know what? If you feel like it's your responsibility that you are the sheriff of Christianity, that you've got to enforce every law that you have memorized, you're going to live a miserable life and probably be alone. And quite frankly, if you know somebody is living outside uh, of the grace of God, which I don't know if that's possible, but if you think that there's somebody living in sin, if you will, and you feel so compelled to make sure they know they're a sinner, make sure that you have the grace to do that. Because if they're not willing to hear it, you shouldn't be willing to say it. You know, there are times that people get open to the gospel, and let me tell you how, many, how that works. They get open to the gospel when they trust you with the gospel. In other words, you don't use the gospel as a hammer. You don't use the good news to beat somebody up that's already beat down. And it's very important. So 
Paul says this in 1 Timothy 1. In other words, he appraised himself. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul used himself as the standard of the worst sinner. And yet here he was, one of the greatest apostles ever, and he's writing a pastoral epistle to Timothy identifying himself as the worst sinner. When we can do that, guess what? Nobody else is worse than us. And the problem is in Christianity is that we're measuring people, which we should never do anyway, we're measuring them by their behavior, not their heart. There is one particular person in my life that I love with everything in me. And the behavior that's exhibited sometimes is really off the charts. But I see so deep beyond the behavior that I love this person as much as I love anybody in the world. And every time anybody says something about this individual, I look and I say, you know what? If I was in trouble, this would be the one person I would call because they would drop everything and come and help me. And I said, but you have to understand, that is the way I want to see everybody. You say, well, what if they're not really that way? Jesus sees you that way, and he knows everything about you. And, And some people would call this a sloppy gospel. It's not a sloppy gospel. The gospel means good news. There is hope for all people. And we represent the King of kings and the Lord of lords to bring that hope to all people. And so if we lift Jesus up, he said, if I be lifted up, not their problems, not their sin. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. He said, lift me up. Lift me up. So if somebody's doing something bad, say, man, God is so good. And he loves you so much. Instead of you're so evil and you're so corrupt. God loves you so much. And I just want you to know that today. That will do more than telling them how bad they are when you tell them how good God is. I hope the 11 o'clock gets this better. (laughs) Listen to me. This is good news. This is good news. We ought to be revved up. We got people today that, 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 that I just keep lifting Jesus up. I just want to call and say, why aren't you in church? And and, and I just keep saying, man, God is doing some awesome things. I believe two things are going to happen real soon. Either revival is going to break out or he's going to return. I can't miss That's where I'm at. What do you think about the world today? God's going to do something to stir the nation. God is going to do something to stir the nation. Well, what if he doesn't? Then he's coming back. We can't lose. They think, what are you on? I'm on a dose of the Holy Ghost. (laughs) Three times a day. We are not always what we do, but what we do can make us who we are if we don't stop it. So we do have to alter things. So, I love the story of the sower, the meaning of the parable of the seed and the sower. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. In other words, there's constantly, Jesus is constantly dropping seed in the hearts of humanity. And, and, and people say, why is Jesus this way? Why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he do that? The reality is, again, we have to look inside ourselves. Am I a recipient of the seed? Am I willing to hear it, cultivate it, protect it, cover it, water it? Am I willing to do that? And see, we're living in a world today that the seed is being dropped all over the place. And there's seed everywhere. But many people have hardened their hearts to the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God is constantly, through His Son and the Holy Spirit, dropping seed in the souls of mankind. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Folks, let me say this. Most of us who are older... You notice I didn't say old because I'll never be old. But I will be older. And I will be wiser. But we were taught so strongly that if you weren't in church on Sunday and Wednesday, you're probably 
going to hell. Or if Jesus came back on either of those days, you were definitely going to hell if you weren't there. So that was hardcore. So we were scared into going to church, and we went, and we did it. And, and then all of a sudden, we had this revelation when the, the charismatic movement swept the nation in the late 70s, early 80s. We started learning the word, not religious uh, denominational constitutions and bylaws and all of that. We started hearing the Bible, purely the word of God. And it's a seed sown into our hearts and that if we declare the word, the word will flourish in our lives. But the challenge became that you don't have to go to church to go to heaven and you don't have to go to church to be saved. That's all true. But the reality is that when you come to church, what you're doing is you're watering the seed that has been sown. You say, well, I can watch online. Yes, you can. But you can't serve online. And so people who say, well, I don't need church, well, you probably don't need a car either. You know, you can get to work on a bus. But who wants to do that? So you know, there are different ways to get there, and I agree with that. But being in church, he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. He said, don't forsake watching online. He said, don't forsake gathering together. Something supernatural different happens when you come into the house. To me, it's, it's this analogy, it's the same old thing. If you are married and you tell your wife you love her, men, but you don't come home for three months, you don't have a marriage, trust me. Well, you tell God you love him, but you don't go to his house and hug him. I'll leave that right there and let you finish it. Now, again, I'm not saying God will forsake you or leave you because he said he wouldn't. But I want a relationship with Jesus. I don't want to just go to heaven. I don't want to just say, man, when this is all done, I'm going to go. I want a living, breathing relationship with Jesus Christ. And that means if I can't spend an hour and a half, one day a week, in a house of worship, I've got to ask myself the question, how important is he really to me? Those of you watching online, you can get mad at me. You probably already turned me off. But I will pop up on your television. <laughs> because the reality is we're living in a nation that is dozing. It's sleeping. I'm not saying it's not saved. It's sleeping. We, 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 our passion is waning. We can't find an hour and a half on Sunday to get in the house of God. How do you explain that? Don't try to explain it to me because I'm not going to judge you. I'm already going to be up there swimming in the pool of heaven. Then goes on to say, The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. I probably ought to move really fast through this one because this is exactly where we are today. We no longer have a Sabbath. We no longer have a day of rest where we actually trust the Lord and say, you know what, God, I could be working and making money, but I trust you. I'm not stopping, but for a moment I'm pausing. I'm going to give some time to you. That was the topic of my Zoom conversation with these other leaders yesterday. But the seed on good soil stands for those who with noble and a good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So, instead of finding dirt on others, why don't you start making yourself good dirt? God, here I am. I'm good dirt. Drop all the good in me you want to drop, and I'm going to flourish. Because I'm planted by the streams of water, and I am going to... To flourish in the courts of my God, I'm going to flourish. Second thing is call it out, not just call it what it is, but call it out. I'm going to try to move fast. Edmund Burke, one of the foremost political speakers of the 18th century, said this All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Evil will triumph in our country, in our lives, and in our families 
if we do nothing. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? The kids that you cut off, the kids that you burned the bridge, the family members that you've cut out of your life, it doesn't mean you have to hang with them, but you have to be willing to hang for them. You have to say, look, I'm praying for them. I may not be around them, but I'm praying for them. I'm not going to quit loving them. I'm not going to quit believing. I'm not going to quit. So doing nothing doesn't mean that you have to go in and intervene and, and rescue them, but it does mean that in your prayer time, in your thoughts, as you speak to the Lord, that they are a part of that. And you're not asking God, I've heard this people, I'm just praying they hit bottom. No, 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 no. They go splat. Say, God, I know, let them get close, but let there be a net right there. May they see the rock six inches below their face. But I'm praying they don't hit bottom. Because if they do, who's going to be there to pick them up? Because they're not going to listen to you because you were a part of helping them hit bottom. This, is, uh, this takes too long. When Peter visited Antioch, he caused the believers to stumble over his behavior. Here we go back to the church at Corinth. So I confronted him to his face. Paul saying this. He enjoyed eating with the Gentile believers who didn't keep the Jewish customs up until the time Jacob's Jewish friends arrived from Jerusalem. When he saw them, he withdrew from his Gentile friends, fearing how it would look to them if he ate with Gentile believers. Peter was in a no-win situation. What he could have done, he could be in a winning situation if he said, I believe and I love both of you. I love the Jewish brothers and I love the Gentile brothers. You see what I'm saying? So Paul calls him out. Paul does not burn the bridge. He calls him out. Don't try and get people to stay. Try to get people to obey. That's what, that's what Paul is doing. He wasn't trying to get Peter to stay at the meal. He was trying to get Peter to obey God. He was pointing out what it means to be obedient to the Lord. And, and he didn't say, Peter, you need to leave. You need to get out of here. But he confronts him redemptively to try to get Peter to obey. And then lastly... Call for help. And this is the one that, if you're a baby boomer, this is a tough one because we grew up saying, I don't need any help. And everybody needs help. Everybody needs help. That song that they sang, we all need. We all bleed. We all have broken things in our lives. And the quicker we can admit that, the quicker that we can own that, the quicker we can do that, is when we cry out for help. And say, God, I, I can't do this by myself. And you know what? That is not weakness. That's humility. Amen. It's humility. Saying, God, I, I, I want to humble myself and I realize I need help. I need people in my life that, that, that have strengths I don't have. That have intelligence I don't have. That have knowledge that I don't have. That have the wisdom I don't have. I, I, I've got some, but I don't have all I need. And so that's why I will never be a mature Christian. I will always be a maturing Christian. Because I'm always going to listen and learn. It's called the green banana syndrome. If you are yellow, you're about to rot. Always be a green banana. Put yourself in a place where I'm constantly getting riper and riper and trying to get riper and learn more in God. As Jesus approached Jericho... A blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way, now listen to this, this is really cool. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. These are the followers of Jesus, the mature followers, disciples, comrades. But he shouted all the more. Some of y'all have allowed people to silence you, both believers and unbelievers. Family members and friends. You don't need to be so loud. You don't need to be that way. You don't need that. And you're like, well, I guess maybe I shouldn't. No, this guy said, you know what? I got one shot here. Jesus is passing by, and this may never happen again. And he said, there, I'm, I, man, it would be so cool to have a raw translation of the Bible. We read the Bible so righteous and religiously. I'm telling you, some of these guys were raw. And Jesus edited this out. (laughs) 
I'm just getting, because there were some things in there tell me that Peter was cussing in the middle of some things, but he didn't define it. I am way out on the edge of the limb this morning. And I want to be out there because I am tired of us all thinking we have arrived when we haven't even come close to arriving. And we have judged people based on our intentions, not our actions. Well, I don't do that. Well, yeah, you do, but you don't intend to. There you go. Son of David, have mercy on me, he yelled. Jesus stopped and ordered the man brought to him. Jesus was so cool. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He didn't say, well, you know, I've been good. And, you know, I believe in you. I go to synagogue. (laughs) Jesus, I want to see. He didn't say I'm a good man. I've done all the right things. He said, I just want to see. Now, let me tell you what moved Jesus. His faith moved Jesus. Not his perfect life, but his faith moved Jesus. Now, we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm not minimizing the fact that you need to be in church because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But what I'm saying is faith is what moves Jesus. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So this, this guy who needed to see, this beggar who's blind and needed to see, just said, I, I just want to see. He replied, Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight And followed Jesus praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. So the blind guy who has nothing or nobody, he can't see a thing, sets the standard for those who could see. You got got disciples here telling him, shut up, rebuke him. We are an elite group. Jesus said, no, ain't no elite group in this this world. He said, I love everybody and I, I hear the faith calling. I hear faith calling. My call last week, I think it was, talking about, are you praying big enough? What are, you, are you praying little prayers? Are you asking Jesus to just, you know, can you just give me a meal? Or are you saying, Jesus, if you give me meals, I'll give other people meals. So I need you to bring me more than what I need so I can help other people in need. Those are big prayers. God, don't just pay my electric bill. Help me have enough to pay somebody else's electric bill. Jesus, don't just give me a car. Give me a car so I can get another car so I can give that car away. There are people in the world building businesses that don't know God, but they had the guts and courage to believe they could. It's time for the church to rise up and believe big things are going to happen. When the pull to turn back comes, get help. Don't go back to where you were to get help. Don't go back to old friends that when you were lost and not living for God. And you know what? I had some good friends that when I was lost, and there were some good people. They just know Jesus, and neither did I. And let me tell you something. There is something to be said about the fraternity of the lost and the sorority of the lost. Lost people sometimes do better than church people. You know, we, we get on, I'm going to tell you, there were guys that would fight for me. And I needed them to because they were a lot bigger than me. But they weren't saved, neither was I. But you know what? We, we bonded. The church has got to bond. We fight against each other. We kill our wounded. Rather than we say, well, they're bloody. We don't want to mess with them. And, 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 you know, we just want to kick them to the curb. They made a mistake. And, 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 you know, we need to get rid of them. They make us look bad. Jesus went around people who made everybody look bad. And that's why the religious people hated him, because they weren't invited to the dinners of the secular that he went to. Thank all ten of you. Now, listen to me. Tired of church people thinking that we're better than everybody else when we're not. Everybody needs a Savior. All of us need a Savior. That's what Jelly Roll say. I'm just going to interject. Have any of you listened to Jelly Roll? 
I'm going to tell you, this guy's writing some authentic stuff. Did you watch him on the CMAs? I'm going to tell you something. He preached the gospel. And you can say, well, he's been in prison. He looks like a certain way. I got chills, man. I got chills. I'm thinking he's reaching people I'll never reach. And then I tell you, a lot of Christians will throw him out. I'm going to let that marinate a minute. Because I'm going to tell you something. There will be a lot of churches that would say, you listen to him. I'm going to tell you some of his stuff. I, I listen. I get teary-eyed thinking everything this man went through. And now he's writing authentically about his life and Jesus. Some of you may tune me out, turn me off, and never come back. But I'm going to tell you something. God's getting ready to do something in this house. I promise you, I wouldn't be here if he wasn't. I wouldn't have stayed in a city that's on nobody's bucket list. I've traveled the world, and I'm going to tell you, in Africa, they didn't say, before I die, I got to go to Oklahoma City. I never heard a Brit say that when I taught for three years in London. I never heard a Brit say, can I come to Oklahoma and visit you? Will you keep me in your house? Moving right along. Get around people who won't let you go back the wrong way. I believe something's happening here. And I believe the tension, I feel this tension. It's a spiritual tension. You say, that's a bad thing. No, it's a good thing. Because I used to hunt with bows and arrows. I grew up hunting with guns and bows and arrows. Oh, that nowadays I have to say harvesting. (sighs) And if your bow was not strung right, it didn't have enough to get the arrow to where it needed to go. God is stringing the church. He's stringing the church and it's getting tight and it's getting tense. Because he's getting ready to launch a revival in this nation like we have never seen. And there are people sleeping and if they don't wake up, they'll sleep through this great move of God. Peter didn't cross back over because Paul had enough tension in him to point in the right direction and point out Peter's situation and wrong. When you have a negative thoughts, look for positive people. You know what happens? You say, well, yeah, yeah, no, no. Let me tell you what negative people do. Negative people look for people who will validate their negativity. I need somebody to hurt with me. No, you need somebody to help you, not hurt with you. Now, it doesn't mean that we, we don't love people who are hurting and that we don't grab them and say, you know, I, I'm so sorry that you're hurting. I'm so sorry this is happening. I'm not saying that. But if you start listening, I wouldn't be hurting if my ex hadn't done this or if somebody hadn't done my boss. And stop. So your boss is an idiot. Let's agree and move on. But don't let your boss be your focal point every morning when you wake up. You wake up to Jesus and go, you know what? He may be a certain way. He might have treated me a certain way. But you know what? You treated me another way. You gave your life for me. And I'm standing on that. I'm not going to let him be my God. You're going to be my God. And you're a good God. And whatever happened to me is going to launch me and get through me. And I'm going to the place you've called me to go. you got to get through that. Your boss is not your problem. Remember that. You become your problem when you give in to the problem that you're facing. Don't give in. There will always be people who will talk about you, and that's okay. Just think about it. If they're talking about you, they're thinking about you. That's the way I look at it. So if somebody says something about you, well, I'm so glad that I was a part of that conversation. It's amazing how popular you get among people who hate you. You just don't think you're popular, but you're popular in one crowd or the other, I promise you. People who love you, people who don't love you. And that's okay. And you smile anyway. Don't burn bridges. Just keep on smiling. Your life is on course. Don't get off course because of somebody's voice. Keep moving. Let's pray. Father, thank you that every day that we live, you could burn the bridge looking at all that we do and all that we don't do. The sins of commission, the sins of omission. And God, I thank you today that you never leave us, you never forsake us, you never burn the bridge. We have seasons, and you know that. In those seasons, some are great, some are not so great. We have some good times and some difficult times. 
You did too, Jesus. You had the times where everybody was applauding you and they were having parades for you. And then there were times they were hanging you on a cross. And, and before that, they're saying, crucify him. You never changed. You were the same yesterday, today, and forever. You held your course. You obeyed the Father. And you loved the people. May we do the same. With every head bowed, every eye closed, let's all pray this prayer together. Say, Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son for my sin. Jesus, today, I want to thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I give my life to you. I repent of my sin. And I declare today, I am born again. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in-house, in a moment, our prayer team will be the left of the stage, my left, your right. I want you to go visit one of them and say, today I gave my life to Jesus. Would you keep praying for me? What did I say? Get help. Get help. Don't walk out here and say, man, I can't tell anybody I got born again, how embarrassing I needed Jesus. You're in a whole church that needs Jesus, all right? All of us. Uh, if you're watching online, text the word SAVED, 405-500-1310. Do it right now. Follow through the template there. It'll lead you through. Do that so we can be praying for you. At this time, I want to receive our tithes and offerings. And uh, I want to remind you that we give out of obedience. That's the reason we give. And, and now, when we obey, the Bible says those who are willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land. When we obey, we experience the fruit of that obedience. But what drives us to give is obedience. That's my, what drives me. If, if I never got anything, I would give and, and find great joy in it because that's what God said do. Now, that's, that's hardcore. That statement right there is for Christians who are mature. Now, for those of you who are getting there, and I'm not saying this to be condescending at all, but he did say that he would give back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He said, if you do that, if you obey, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open the windows of heaven. I'm going to pour out so much blessing, you won't even have room enough to hold it all. That's what God wants to do. And so I've contemplated introducing the old thing, and I've told you this, and I, someday I'm probably going to do it. But it, it's, it, it, those of you who remember me at Victory, it was as we bring our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. We are believing for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, growth in business, settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what it's all about is promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's do that. If you want to give uh, online, you can put your phone on the QR code behind me. And I'm by faith saying it's there. And, uh, and so you can do that. It'll walk you through setting up your debit card or credit card. Or you can text the word GIVE to 405-546-2226. It's the same deal. You can do it 24-7 throughout the year. It's easy to do. Set it up. Walk through it. It's easy. You can also give on your way out. You can mail to 5821 Northwest Expressway, Oklahoma City 73132. Or you can go to our website, mosaicokc.church forward slash give. I want to thank all of you who do give. I am, for one, very grateful. And uh, I get to keep preaching the gospel. A friend of mine just started another church. He had a church of about 10,000 in San Jose. Retired. Been retired for several years, and he couldn't take it anymore. 79 years old. He started another church in Sacramento, and I was on the phone with him yesterday, and he said, he said, you know, he said, I, I just got a voice. He said, I, I got a voice it for Jesus. And he's got more than enough money to retire. I mean, he's done great in his life. But I want you to know I don't take this lightly because if I'm not preaching to you, I'll preach to the rocks and they'll cry out. I don't know. I don't know. Something like that. I don't know. So anyway. Well, let's stand. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come to my left. You're right. If you need prayer for any reason at all, please stop by and let one of them pray for you. And uh, if this is your first time here. Please stop by our welcome kiosk, and we have a gift for you. If you want to serve, also stop by there and say, I, I want to do something. I want to be an usher, a greeter, parking lot attendant, prayer partner, whatever it is. Stop by, get signed up, somebody will call you, all right? One, two, three, hallelujah. Hallelujah.